AM Agenda with Kieran Gilbert. Good morning and welcome to the program. It's been revealed a young Westerner photographed alongside IS fighters late last year. He's not British as initially reported, but an 18-year-old from suburban Melbourne. This follows news of the weekend that two teenage brothers from southwestern Sydney had been intercepted at Sydney Airport by Customs under suspicion that they were off to join Islamic State in the Middle East. With me this morning, the former Immigration Minister, now Social Services Minister Scott Morrison. Mr Morrison, thanks for your time. There's a lot to talk talk about in your portfolio of social services. I'll get to that in a sure. moment. I just want to get your reaction to this on the security front. Uh, and well, first of all, this 18 year old from Melbourne, uh, this profile of this young individual re will really shock many. I, I think that uh, he comes from a non-Muslim family, uh, a non-Middle Eastern family and uh, very much mainstream suburban Melbourne. Well, it's very hard to make assumptions about who's going to fall prey uh, to the death cult and uh, their indoctrination and, and their recruiting tactics. I mean, we've seen it in, in, within uh, communities within Australia, um, in, in more obvious places, but we're also seeing in other places others mightn't expect. So that's why it's very important that uh, the government has every, every um, tool at its disposal to ensure that we're able uh, to, to do whatever we can uh, to ensure that people don't go and join this fight, support this fight, be part of this fight fight and we've got to do everything um, to ensure that we're trying to s uh, support our, our, our allies and others in the region uh, to, put, to put this death cult uh, on the run. And as far as you're aware, um, you, you're no longer the minister, but it, 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 was it that framework, that legal framework, the enhanced powers that enabled the interception of the two teenagers at Sydney Airport at the weekend? Well, I was very pleased to see that, and I want to commend uh, the Customs and Border Protection personnel and, and Minister Dutton. I mean, uh, the, the systems that have been put in place after the, the Sharif incident, uh, not long after the election, we were running on the, the, the previous systems, I think have proved to be very effective. So the establishment of the counter-terrorism unit out of that $630 million package the government put in place, the new legislation as well. I mean, it's the combination of all of these and the strong leadership uh, from Minister Dutton that is getting this job done. But to Roman Quadbeleg and everyone at Customs and Border Protection, job well done. And, uh, OK, let's move on to your area, and there is a lot to talk about. First of all, the $1 billion upgrade of the, the welfare system, the IT system, this is. This is the front of the Australian today. Is this something you're going to put to your Cabinet colleagues, that it does need to be upgraded? upgraded? It sounds quite antiquated. Well, Minister Payne and I have been working on this, particularly Minister Payne, uh, since she came into the portfolio. I mean, this is a system uh, that's been around since the, the late 80s, um, at a time when there was around two and a half million people receiving payments, and now, you know, there's up to 10 million payments being made. Uh, sorry, uh, just under that, actually. And uh, so we've had a massive increase in the number of people interfacing with the system, and uh, it, it's time for it to get uh, some serious attention. And we have, you know, some $400 million worth of transactions every day, 15, 50 million individual transactions. So this is a system that still has manual processing attached to it, Kieran, and uh, it's been left um, to basically wither for, for many years. Now the system's stable, I should stress, but it could run far more efficiently and effective, effectively, both for the users and for the government, and more cost effectively as well. So while it might cost a fair bit to upgrade, a billion dollars is the estimate that uh, the Australian reports, it would save money in the longer term and efficiency. Well, no doubt it would save money longer in, in the, in, in the um, short term even, I would suggest, um, with the sort of changes that you can make immediately and, uh, and the, the changes that can be made to assist people using with the system. And Minister Payne has been doing an incredible job on this in bringing together um, the various options and, uh, and uh, it'll be for her to make further announcements on this in, in the weeks or months ahead, uh, but uh, as we continue to work through this issue. But it's important, I think, for people to first understand that that there is a problem here. I mean, the system we're working off was developed in the 80s um, at a time um, when, frankly, the, the internet and things like uh, what we're looking at today with smartphones and so on um, were, were dreams. 
Let's uh, look at the pension issue. The government wants to, uh, currently pensions are indexed uh, to average male weekly earnings. The government, as we know, as part of its budget, had uh, wanted to, to change that indexation beyond the next election to index to inflation. Reports at the weekend that uh, the government's now considering a sunset clause on that. Can you talk us through it? Well, let's start off with the first principles. The pension goes up every March and every September. And it goes up by either uh, the, uh, the CPI, the higher of the CPI, or the reference to um, Matawi. Now, recently, it's been the CPI increase that has been operating because that has been the higher, and that's what um, has related to the most recent increases in the pension. So pensioners, I think, should be reassured that the pension goes up every March and every September. And uh, the Labor Party's scare campaign on pensions is not a policy, it's just a scare campaign. In terms of how the intergenerational report uh, looks at the, uh, the uh, tracking of these payments out over time, it assumes that once the budget is in a stronger position, uh, then the tracking of uh, the indexation of those payments can change. Now that is a sensible, I think, um, reading of the situation and it shows that the government is very prepared prepared to have a, a genuine conversation about how we can have a more sustainable pension into the future. And I'm disappointed the opposition once again has just ruled out a conversation. I mean, they're, they're conversation stoppers, not starters, when it comes to dealing with the very real and serious issues about the sustainability of the pension. So but if you do adopt the sunset clause idea, does that then diminish the, the sustainability argument of this? this burgeoning cost area? Well, no, because as the intergenerational report which the Treasurer has released demonstrates, uh, it, it does provide for a more sustainable pension if you take that path. Uh, but there are other measures and other ways that this can be addressed and I'm open to that discussion um, with the crossbenchers given the opposition has ruled out yet another policy conversation in their year of the ideas. And so we're keen to have that conversation uh, with them and obviously it has to be undertaken more broadly in, in the context of retirement incomes. I mean, we want people to continue to invest for their own retirement. Self-funded retirees are the great heroes of this country. They, they have not only paid taxes all their lives, they continue to pay them and they're supporting themselves in their retirement. It's a potent political issue. Are you up for the fight here to, to make it uh, a sustainable well, uh, I'm not... pension system, given Labor is blocking, as you say, opposing all of that? Well, I, I don't see why there has to be a fight over this. I think, it's, I think what Australians want to see is some, just some sensible, common-sense discussion about how we deal with some obvious issues. I mean, uh, the ageing of the population is not a myth, it's, it's, it's reality, and uh, I think that presents great opportunities for Australia, but it comes with challenges as well, and we have to talk those issues through and we have to manage them incrementally over time. If we don't do that Kieran then what happens is at some point in the future you have an off the edge of the cliff reform which I think would be very disadvantageous um, to future generations who would want to have a safety net that we've had that we are putting at risk by not addressing these issues and that's why we want to do that. The government won't allow pensioners to, uh, well essentially as some have been uh, uh, worried about arguing that might be the case that they might fall into poverty given the indexation changes? Well, I, I don't want to see that, and that's, I'm not considering any options that I believe would lead to that outcome. Um, I mean, the Treasurer, I think, has made some very good points on the weekend, uh, that if you can uh, get the, uh, the, the size and, and uh, subscription to the pension under control over time, then, um, then you can create some room to move when it comes to the adequacy of the pension. But the adequacy of the pension, I should stress, is foremost in my mind and in the government's mind because it is not a lavish pavement. No one should suggest it is. The government certainly doesn't pretend it is. And that's why it's important wherever we can uh, that Australians, as they age, take the opportunities that they have to be able to supplement their income or increase their income either by working or by taking down on, on the various assets or other resources they have available to them. That's the mix, that's the package, and we want to maximise how people use all of that uh, for their benefit, first and foremost. It's not about doing something to the country. I mean, certainly the country benefits, but at the end of the day, I want people as they age to have a good retirement um, with a sustainable um, uh, cost of living and uh, sustainable incomes.
Mr Morrison, finally, many of our viewers are in rural areas. Uh, I'd like you to just talk us through an announcement you made very early this morning relating to some additional support for drought affected farmers. What does that entail? Well, Minister Joyce and I, we're, we're topping up the Family Relationship Counselling support uh, to families in drought affected areas in New South Wales and, and Queensland. That comes on top of the over 10 million funding that we announced last year. Um, there has been a need to further increase that to take us through to the end of, the, of June. The these families are still doing it tough, Kieran, and as we all know, when, when families do it tough, that can create some tensions, and we want to make sure that we're there to help them work through those issues through the family relationships counselling services that are available and uh, provided by great organisations all through those districts who really understand the pressures that those families are under, and we're happy to support them. Okay, Mr Morrison, thanks for your time this morning. Appreciate it. Thanks a lot, Kieran. Good to be with you.